construction considerations of this next presentation. You've heard quite a bit of this in other presentations, so I'm going to kind of step through this pretty quickly and then maybe concentrate on what you hadn't heard before and, and not try to repeat what we, we've already heard. So I'm going to go through a, a little bit about uh, materials used during constructions, um, processing placement, and touch on, we haven't really talked about quality assurance, quality controls. I'm going to touch on that a little bit. Um, the placement method for filters and drains, uh, importance of protecting those during construction to make sure they don't get contaminated. You just place them very carefully. I want to make sure of that. Look at the methods to uh, compact clay core and filter materials. I think we've talked about that a bit. Test fills. David Serafini talked about test fills. I'm just going to touch on that again. Um, again, QA, QC, and um, I, I've embedded a couple of uh, short case histories uh, in here as well. So I wanted to start off with this quote that was from 90 years ago. Um, applies really to any construction project, but entirely safe and substantial design may be entirely ruined by careless, shoddy execution. The failure of the structure may, the failure of the structure may possibly be the result so careful attention to the details of construction is therefore fully as important as the investigation and design. So whoever wrote that 90 years ago, I mean, it's still pertinent, obviously, today. In fact, um, we in the core would require the designer to be involved during the construction process, particularly if there's any changes in the foundation and um, if there is uh, any, any uh, design changes that have to be made. So some uh, general uh, considerations for construction. Um, the uh, prepare the designs construction process. Uh, and uh, Ed Friend went over this as far as you're, you're planning kind of for the worst conditions. You, you have to make sure that uh, you have plans in place. Um, and then your specifications has to have to uh, include how you deal with failed tests. So you're going to remove and replace and document that. Uh, also including in your specifications unforeseen foundation conditions and how those would be treated. Uh, waters and, and excavations uh, have to have details about dewatering systems, who is going to design it, um, and some of the requirements about how far the, the, the uh, water surface has to be drawn down to the below the bottom of your excavation. Typically that's in the two to three foot range. Um, Shortage of boral materials, I'm actually going to cover that in a, in a case history here as well. And we've talked about you really don't know what's in your foundation until it's completely excavated. Construction material methods, I think we've talked about a lot of these in the past before. Um, and certainly the documentation of uh, observations is as, as, as important as test results as far as uh, QA, QC is concerned. David Serafini put this... Uh, material distribution chart uh, up uh, during his presentation. And, and this is the one that was included in the design drawings of Isabella. And uh, I just wanted to point out that uh, here's all the sources of materials over here with their estimated quantities. In the middle of the chart is the processing that would be required to then turn it into all the different zones for Isabella and then the quantities of those materials. So. Again, they wanted to give the contractor a really good idea of sort of a roadmap of where all the materials are going to be used and what was available. They actually, uh, the Isabella team hired an, an expert, a subject matter expert, just on the processing part as part of the, of the government to help out with that specific uh, uh, element. So again, the specifications for, for all the zones, of course, you have to re, you know, put in specs for gradation and moisture content. Um, and uh, they have to, the, 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 the uh, specifications have to include not only the gradation of like your, your drain materials and your sand, but also to protect those stockpiles in place so you don't uh, uh, induce contamination of that. Core material, you may have to screen some of the larger material uh, out. And then pre-wetting and disking. Um, I've worked on a, on a few projects, and it, it's fairly common that you would have what's called a mixing table off from where the actual placement is uh, with clay. You'd have a, a dozer, a water truck, uh, in, a, in a big disc working the material. 
that is nearby, uh, and then you check moisture content periodically to make sure it's within the moisture content range. Uh, usually you lose uh, about a percent or two uh, from moisture content in the mixing table by the time you bring it, spread it, and compact it. So you kind of have to keep that in mind, but that's, it's, it, it, it's, it's a standard practice to, to mix that material ahead of time uh, and then try to avoid it on the fill, particularly from a production standpoint, but, but also to make sure that that moisture content is relatively uniform in your fill. So filters and drains, again, uh, protecting them from contamination, uh, maintaining, and how to do that, you maintain those filters uh, above that fine grain material. You may want to windrow it if there's a storm coming, windrow right next to where the, the filters and drains are as the whole thing's coming up, and that'll help protect uh, from uh, infiltration for surface water runoff. And oftentimes, water truck guy, is that's his job, is to water the fill but sometimes they get kind of carried away. So that's where uh, QA, QC comes into, into play. Now, Ed, Ed had part of this, this slide, um, part of this view up here, but I, I wanted to just uh, highlight this for a second. Uh, he talked about the chimney tree effect when you're placing a, so this would be a, 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 sin, a, a single uh, filter chimney that would be adjacent to uh, in the dam itself, so you had a core material on this side and shell, and uh, everything's coming up at the same time. So if this was your initial case, and let's just say that you're, you're up to this elevation right here, and you'd place that, that uh, your last lift of, of the sand chimney would be slightly above your, your core material to protect it. Then you put your, your next lift of sand on it, you place your core and your, and your shell material on each side and compact that in place and then you compact your filter in those steps. And I just wanted to include this photo, which you can kind of see the trimney effect here. And then that was a test trench that was done on a project to verify that you had your minimum width requirement and then to also look at contamination um, of, the, uh, of, the, of the sand filter. I talked earlier about the trench method, and there's the steps um, that are included. I just had talked about that, so I'm not going to talk. The only thing I want to mention here is certainly very prone to contamination, uh, from, but uh, the, the side walls, you would be excavating this through probably somewhat of a cohesive material that's a little bit above optimum, but you do have to be very aware of material coming in because you're going to pack the sand as it comes up. So there, there has to be a lot of scrutiny from a QA, QC standpoint, make sure that's, that's clean. Um, uh, QA, QC of the, of the trench again, this is that same project and you can see somebody is measuring to make sure that they have the, the minimum width. And if I go back here for, if, see if I go back here just for one second, um, you can see that in, in this case, this had to be three feet um, and it was more than that because of the Christmas tree effect. You, you actually was closer to at least on the four to five foot range effectively because as Ed had mentioned, you do have some sand that is sort of wasted on that, trim, trim, uh, that uh, Christmas tree effect. Another method that has been used quite effectively is a spreader box. So you can see there's filter sand here and there's drain stone. Uh, so two different um, elements can be placed at the same time. And those last two methods that I, I showed you with the Christmas tree and the trench, the trench is narrow and you're only placing filter sand there and not drain stone. So that's one of the detriments of those two methods that you'd have to have a much uh, wider excavation. Then you'd have cross contamination between your sand and your filter stone. So you really can't use those two methods if you're putting in two zones. But this trench box, and this came right out of a FEMA document. Um, what the, what the, the uh, advantages of this is that you put the, uh, the drain stone, you have a divider in the center here. You put the filter sand on one side, drain stone on the other. It's exactly the width that you need. And with this plate across here, it's exactly at the loose lift thickness that you need. And that, that dozer in this case just drags that thing along and you keep placing material in as you go. And then you moisture condition it and compact it. So you're really not uh, contaminating it 
Um, and that certainly has been used on, on, on many projects. So important to uh, make sure that you protect your, your sand. I think this is the filter here, and this is the drain stone. You don't wanna have any low areas to, to have something like this happen, particularly if it's a storm event. And this is where you could put um, little berms on each side to protect from, uh, from the slow uh, wind rows and make sure that you grade uh, to drain, if there's, particularly if there's a large storm coming. So for filters and drains, you're gonna have to cross uh, those filters and drains from the core typically because you're hauling material and as the whole embankment comes up, you can't, you, you won't have access on the downstream slope. So you're inevitably gonna have to cross it, but you're, you're, you wanna make sure your specifications limit where you cross. You do not want the contractor to just cross anywhere that they want to cross because there's a huge amount of contamination. It looks like from this photo that came out of a FEMA document, you can see some of the sort of dirtiness here uh, on the drain material. So this looks like the clay core, probably the sand filter and maybe the drain material out here. So um, you want to certainly limit where they cross. And I, I've got a detail to show you in a second, but usually you use sacrificial material where it crosses. You put a geotextile down, maybe a steel plate, and you cross at that location. And uh, that's what this next slide is showing. That then you remove all the material in that area. And more importantly, you need to sample it after you think you have all the contamination done. You wanna sample uh, pretty intensively right in that immediate area to make sure you're still, uh, you're, uh, you've cleaned up anything that was uh, potentially contaminated. So um, this slide, uh, we've touched already, I think, on compaction methods, both for sand and for the clay core. You know, typically with sand, you wanna, you wanna add water immediately, actually during compaction. So water is critical to compact the sand. And I, I've mentioned the clay core before. A, a, a mixing table is oftentimes used for the clay core. Um, and uh, moisture condition it before it hauls to the site. And then of course you use uh, appropriate compaction equipment for the core uh, versus the, uh, the sand. Um, th for, the, for the core, I mean, typically <clears throat> we look at eight inch um, thick loose lifts and we've talked about the, you know, being slightly above optimum. And I, I mentioned earlier in the last presentation about making sure you have bonds between uh, lifts as well. And if you have a storm event that's coming, the typical procedure is to use a smooth drum roller to seal the top of that. And then of course you have to disc it. But if you left it like this and a big storm was coming, you know, it'd be quite a quagmire afterwards. So a steel drum roller, then you take your disc to it after that storm event um, had occurred. So this just shows you uh, operation. This is taken again from Isabella with the chimney filters, chimney drain, the transition. And in this photo, there isn't, uh, this is the blanket, so they haven't placed the, the rock fill on this, at this location yet. So compacting around structures, we've talked about that to make sure that that's a very susceptible place to crack. Um, and, and then uh, also on, on fragile foundations, on fragile type rocks, you wanna push the material out onto that and not get equipment directly operating on the rock. You wanna wet those surfaces as well before you add fill to them, because you would, you would kind of take moisture out of the fill that's already properly conditioned. So you wanna make sure that uh, you uh, gently uh, wet, wet that material. When you're placing against, right against the structure, typically you'd have a, a like four inch lift and then you would limit your maximum size uh, uh, particle in there because of the lift thickness. More frequent inspection right up next to the structure as well. So test fills, um, and for Isabella, there was a specification that was included in the earthwork spec that detailed the requirements for the contractor of the test fill. And of course, for the, for the government, for the Corps, we had our whole list of, of observations and testing that we were gonna uh, do as well. The contractor really didn't know, need to know what our testing was, but we, we gave requirements in there. So we, we actually, we also included drawings on there. So of course they had an idea what was gonna be constructed. 
So the benefits of using a test fill, we could determine the minimum number of passes. You know, for a filter sand, you don't want to overcompact the sand. You start breaking particles down, um, which would reduce, of course, the hydraulic conductivity. And then it also, if you overcompact it, you have a chance that it's, it's going to be a brittle structure and it could crack. And you don't want that filter to crack. So you can determine the minimum number of passes um, during construction. And, and actually, at Isabella, what they did was uh, they, they took gradations in the stockpile before they started. And then they took gradations after two passes with a 10 ton roller, after four passes, after six passes, and compared those gradations and see how much it was breaking down uh, for each roller pass. And that was during the test fill. So evaluation of particle breakdown, like I said. Contractor and, and specifications, it says that they have to use what is proposed for equipment on the test fill. If, if partway through the construction they decided to change equipment, then they're going to have to do another test fill to, to verify that they can meet the in-place requirements of the material being placed. And then uh, to ensure that means and methods. So, you know, we were kind of criticized, I remember, on uh, Isabella about why are we paying the contractor to do this? And I think it's the first time that um, the uh, core people to get them uh, lined up on the test fill as well as contractors, personnel coming together. And to me, it was money well spent because you, you want to not have a whole bunch of arguments on the production fill. You try to work out all the details as far as how they're going to control lift thicknesses, um, you know, what type of equipment and the breakdown and whatnot. So if I was to do it again, I'd still uh, use that. So a, uh, a quick Quote, and I'm just going to go through this very briefly here, QAQC, and Ralph Peck had a, had a good quote here, that there are a few things of more importance in ensuring quality of a construction job than to have a set of eyes attached to a calibrated brain observing the construction operations. So in a nutshell, to me, you're calibrating yourself as a QA person out on the site, and, and after you do that, you should have some idea of just what the material looks like and comparing that with, with test results, whether it passes or not. You can only test a very, very small fraction of what's going in place. So your sort of calibrated brain is going to be able to tell you, it looks like it's out of spec, either the core or, or the, the filter material. We need to do some extra testing here. So I think you'll get a, a feel for the material. And that's another good thing about the test fill. You'll be able to do that um, as we go. Dam safety modification projects, a lot of them have been done because of poor uh, foundation preparation. So that's why it's so important to get that, that correct. And we've talked about cleaning and, and treating and, and mapping the foundations. So importance of uh, construction QA. Um, there is, uh, you wanna make sure that, um, it, it's obviously the QA is independent uh, if you see something, obviously say something and make sure it's corrected on time. Um, and really, the, the first level of defense, so to speak, for any project should be the QC, the quality control of the contractor. And then the QA's job is to oversee that, that uh, QC operations. And then uh, at, from a QA, from the government side, we also do uh, uh, testing that will actually be used to confirm the, uh, the project was acceptable. Again, calibrating um, your sort of eyes to the test results um, and, uh, and making sure the design team is involved with any changes. Um, talked about winter construction a little bit uh, and, and the importance to make sure that no frozen material is placed. And I actually will, will go over that a little bit more in, in a presentation. Um, to end the whole session here. So very briefly, uh, Pine Creek Dam, core project, uh, embankment dam, uh, built in 1969. Uh, we had an outlet and a spillway, and, this, and the issues were uh, really related to highly erodible material that was adjacent to the outlet uh, and leakage around that outlet conduit. So I'm just gonna touch on um, the, uh, the filters in the vicinity of the outlet, if you recall. That was, that's one of the fixes of an outlet, and I had a presentation earlier, is to, is to put 
a, a, a filter blanket right adjacent to the outlet to uh, control that seepage. So this is the excavation at Pine Creek Dam. Here is the, here's the outlet pipe. We're looking downstream. And one of the things they did, was they put a berm. This is the dam crest. They put a berm right adjacent. So any overland flow, they tried to prevent it from coming down this slope because they're placing the sand as a collar around the uh, conduit. So that was one of the methods they used to, to limit that. They also benched the slope to try to uh, prevent higher velocities from carrying it down into their excavation, contaminating their sand. And then you see they also put silt fence in locations on those benches to try to retain anything that was going to move. Even with all that, they had a storm event, and took a lot of uh, hand work to clean it all up. And I just had, uh, so here they are placing, here is this, uh, this collar right here. I think the outlet is right over here and extends a pretty good distance on each side of, of the outlet. It's a fairly large diameter outlet. So I just have one, one real quick question for the group. Is there anything that you see as a potential is issue with this operation? Contamination. So you see that truck pulling across, rubber tired truck, and, and here's looks like kind of a clay material. Here's your nice sand, and it looks like there could be some some uh, some of that clay uh, in the in the tracks. So you really have to have. I wasn't intimately involved in this project, but you'd have to have a, a QA QC. Maybe that's what this guy's doing. I don't know, but some laborers out here certainly cleaning that up. So. So some lessons learned from that, no matter what the system is, it seems like there's always problems with contractor uh, erosion uh, methods. Um, always make sure there's additional protection of the filters. And then the, the, the team that put these recommendations just suggested that maybe, maybe as the core or the owner, you want to design those protection systems in, into your system, make sure that those sand is, uh, is clean. Now, David gave an extensive um, case history on Isabella, and this is a really short one. Uh, this is that dog leg on the auxiliary dam. This is the excavation for the core trench. So I just want to talk real briefly um, uh, on a on a uh, on Isabella. They had to strip. There was uh, some uh, cobbles on the downstream slope from the existing dam. They had to strip those out uh, in order to then place the material. As you recall, it was a downstream raise. Of Isabella, so all the filters and drains were coming up, and the filter sand was going to be placed right against here. But when you did that, this is what happens, of course, is erosion rills on that downstream slope, because that material had to come off uh, early on in the process. So the uh, the contractor then uh, I don't know why he didn't use a smooth uh, bucket here, but he he uh, he welded a piece of angle iron to a bucket that he had, and he smoothed out the slopes. And there was an intensive amount of handwork as well to be done to get rid of those erosion rills prior to placing the sand on that. If there's a material that is uh, out of spec, of course, you want to excavate it. Uh, you want to sample it when it goes back in, make sure it makes spe uh, meets spec, and you want to document the location and elevation of where the, that failed material was. This is just a big processing area, um, the on-site aggregate plant at Isabella, and uh, uh, as all of us that work for the Corps, there was a there was a lot of a, a lot of effort to uh, to get real estate involved because that was not part of the government land, so it was that had to be done pretty quickly. So I talked about protecting the filters where you have a crossing. So this came from uh, Isabella as well. You see they put geotextile down here and put some steel plates over the top so it wouldn't tear the geotextile. And again, you would make sure that, that all those uh, materials had met after that, that crossing was done. So this is just a close up of, of, the, of a foundation uh, at uh, Isabella, of course, once you get it mapped and it gets, it gets cleaned, it gets mapped, um, then you would shape your foundation. Ed went through those details. And, uh, and then uh, in this area, this is where the, the filter sand was going to be placed. So again, if this was a core, you'd go through uh, a, a very intense 
cleaning method here and, and make sure it's all shaped properly. And then the last slide, I talked about this before, but this is just a filter system on the upstream slope of Isabella, the rock, uh, the, the bedding stone, and the, uh, the filter underneath. And then I think this was taken, this is the, uh, is the core material. Again, they needed that, that three-phase system because of the size of the rock that was really from, from the length of the fetch that was there.